The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, escorted by all the angels, then he will take his seat on the throne of glory. All the nations will be assembled before him, and he will separate men one from another as the shepherd separates sheep from goats. He will place the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you whom my father has blessed, take for your heritage the kingdom prepared for you since the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you made me welcome. Naked, and you clothed me. Sick, and you visited me. In prison, and you came to see me. Then the virtuous will say to him in reply, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and make you welcome, naked and clothe you, sick or in prison, and go to see you? And the king will answer, I tell you solemnly, in so far as you did this to one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it to me. Next, he will say to those on his left hand, go away from me with your curse upon you, to the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you never gave me food. I was thirsty and you never gave me anything to drink. I was a stranger and you never made me welcome, naked and you never clothed me, sick and in prison and you never visited me. Then it will be their turn to ask, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, a stranger or naked, sick or in prison, and did not come to your help? Then he will answer, I tell you solemnly, in so far as you neglected to do this to one of the least of these, you neglected to do it to me. And they will go away to eternal punishment and the virtuous to eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we've come to the end. And at the end, the world always looks so different, doesn't it? You don't find so? And as we come to the last Sunday in this liturgical year, the church ends the year with this feast, the feast of Christ the King. Christ the universal King. Christ the King of all peoples. And, and it comes from, from the reading. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, he escorted by the angels to take his seat on the throne of glory and all nations will be assembled before him and he will separate them. All nations. The idea of this piece of Christ the universal king is that we have to start understanding that Christianity is not about an event that happened 2,000 years ago. It's about the dynamic force that is transforming the world from inside out. It's about a dynamism of transformation like the world has never seen before. And a dynamism of transformation that, that if we get it, would move the world to another stage of its existence. And when we don't get it, it holds the whole world back from its destiny. And it holds the whole world back from what God created this world for. If Christ is a universal king, then his kingdom 
is a kingdom of love and peace. His kingdom is a kingdom of love and peace. And that sounds like nice words, but that's what the text is getting at. And that's what the text is, is pushing us, pushing us hard to see. This is the third of the great evaluation texts that they, we've had over the last three weeks. Remember three weeks ago we had the one with the ten virgins, five wise, five foolish. And uh, the foolish ones didn't have oil for their lamps. And remember the lamp was from, we got the meaning of that from Matthew 5, put your lamp, don't put it under a bushel, put it up on a lampstand. So the people seeing your good works will give glory to God and God your Father in heaven. So the light was the good works that they did. Well, well, we come back and the judgment again is about the good works. You either have them or you don't. So if you don't have oil, you can't produce the light. The light is the good works. You don't have oil, the good works will not be there. You will be separated out as a goat. Anybody ever call you a old goat? Yes. Eh? Wait, wait, a man say yes. <laughs> but you're a old goat. Listen, man, run, you know. A goat is a most stubborn beast. Own way. You, you can't get two goats to agree to do nothing at all. And if you try to pull goats, to, man, every goat pulling against every other goat and, and, and it's mayhem in the place. Sheep are more docile. And they more enter into the shepherd's command and desire. And the sheep will come around each other and, and huddle together. And, and, and they will be led easily by, by the shepherd. And, and so already we have an understanding that oil, light, good works are part of this evaluation. And we come back to our text and we see here in the text that it's the good works that we produce. When I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. I was sick and you visited me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was a stranger, you, did, you, you came and you helped me. The, these are the, the good works that the church now calls the corporal works of mercy and, and holds them up as, as the things that, that we must be doing if we are actually Catholic, that these are the things that our whole life must revolve around. Our reading last week, which talked about the three people, one given five talents, one given two talents, and one given one. And the man with the one talent went and dug, dug a hole and he hid it. And he said, you know, I heard that you were an exacting man and, and I was afraid, so I hid the talent and here it is, you can have it back. And we saw that that is a, a reflection backwards to, to Genesis. And, and in Genesis, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, Adam said to God, I heard you come in the, in the garden. I was afraid and therefore I hid. And, and here we have the drama of salvation history. Do you really believe that Jesus is the good shepherd or not? Because the guy who was condemned last week did not believe that Jesus was the good shepherd. That the master was good. Don't mind what he gave away was incredibly generous. He, couldn't, he still could not believe that God was generous, good, and, and, and true to his word. And, and this is where the access is. I know today there are many homilies that are going to be preached, waxing warm on the, on the need to give. And waxing warm on, on, on why we must care for the poor. And waxing warm on, on, on why caring for the poor is essential to Christianity. And, and they're all right. But there's something below that that I don't think we get at easily. And, and it, is, it is coming from last week's reading that, that the people who come to salvation are those who actually believe that God is who God says he is. And that's why they act the way they act. The clue in the text comes when the, the virtuous are, are rewarded and, 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 and they're astonished and, and they say to the king, well, you know, when, when was it that we did these things? I, 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 I am dumbfounded, I'm happy, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm happy, I'm happy you selected me for the kingdom, but, but when did we do these things? That's the clue in the text. You see, because we have this and we see this as the final exam, we do the old cheating thing that we like to do from school, and eh? 
Are are feed you hungry? Tick. Are the clothing naked? Tick. Phew. All right. What's the next one, boy? Drink, drink. Let, let me let me buy some drink for somebody who thirsty. Tick. Let, what what was the next one? Prison. Oh gosh, how are we getting into prison to visit somebody now? We 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 act in the opposite direction than the text is impelling us. We, we, we try to fulfill the text in its most literal form. And that, that is a first stage of Christianity. But it's not what the text is speaking to, I think. I think what the text is actually speaking to is becoming the kind of person who would, by nature, reach out to the poor and, and give people what they are in need of because of the kind of person that we become. And therefore, we do these actions not because we want to get into heaven. We do these actions because we've come to know the incredible love of God. And, and because we know this love, what else can we do? When we encounter God, there, there are several impulses that come our way. The first impulse when we encounter God is the contrition. Peter said, Lord, get behind me. I am a, I, I'm a sinful man. And, and, and Peter wanted to hide from him because, because Peter saw his own sinfulness and, and, and God used Peter in his sinfulness. And, and then when you, when you get the fact that your sin sickness is not an obstacle to God, then, then something else arises as an impulse and that's gratitude. And you start to realize that you know, as wayward and foolish and stupid and idiotic as I am, God, God still somehow has chosen to love me. And, and, and that blows your mind in a direction that you can't even hold anymore. And because you understand the, the, the incredible love that God has, despite my own foolishness, gratitude arises from the soul and that becomes a reaction to God. And out of that gratitude, something else happens. Because when, when, you, when you still see that, that, that you keep being stupid and God keeps being loving, something else happens. And you start to become more like God and, and compassion is what emerges from there. Mercy is what emerges. And when mercy emerges from the soul, then, then how can I not treat with love my brother and my sister who I see when, when God has treated me with a love that has been so mind-blowing that I can't even hold or com comprehend it and that becomes the third impulse of the soul where the soul becomes so joined to God that 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 what can I do but show mercy if you have experienced the mercy of God in your utter stupidity, how could we not be merciful to those who come to us? And there are so many parables that we have had over this year on that single point. And that's the point on which the whole of the gospel turns. And this is why this is a, a kingdom of mercy, a kingdom of love. Because, because mercy is what the lover does when the beloved messes up. And mercy is what we are called to do when we meet another who, whose life is not where it ought to be. Mercy is a call that we have, and that's why these are the corporal works of mercy. It, it's not just about ticking off the boxes of, of all the things uh, to make sure that when, when you see Jesus, you say, well, well, no, 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 I, I, I gave food to a man, you know, his name was Fred, and, and, and I gave a drink to a woman, yeah, yeah, she, she was Janet, and, 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 and I, that's not it. It, it is that you have become a certain kind of person. And that kind of person, whoever you meet, will respond with a love and a mercy and a compassion that, that will reflect the face of God. And, and because it happens from inside of you, it's not something that you're looking at or counting. And, and therefore, no matter what happens, you, you are the person who will just do the merciful thing to another without counting it, without seeing it. Be because you have come to know the incredible love of God, that love deep in your bowels flows out to all humanity. And that's God's plan for the transformation of the world. That is his plan. We've, we've been trying to do Christianity as a willpower religion. 
And we're trying to do Christianity from outside in. If you miss Mass on a Sunday, you're going to hell. God, I better do that tick. Don't do these things. Okay, all right, let me, let me, let me try my best not to do them tick. That's not Christianity. That is not, that's not what Jesus came to do. What he came to do is far more profound than all of that. What he came to do is turn the whole world upside down and help the whole world to see that love and love alone is the answer to every single question and problem in the modern world today. Only love. Only love. And, and that's why the text is so profound. Because it's not that we are here to feed the poor and to do this and that. We are here to be transformed by Jesus Christ. And when we are so transformed, then the poor will be fed. And the hungry will know what they need and, and have it satisfied. And, and, and those who are in prison will experience care and love. And those who are strangers will be welcomed. That is the result of, of an encounter with God that turns our life into, into Christian impulse. And it is that conversion of heart that Jesus calls us to on this last day. Because he is a king. And he's a king of, of the will in our mind. And he's a king of our hearts. And he's a king of conscience. But his kingdom is a kingdom of love. And love cannot be demanded. Love can only be responded to. And so it's not doing it because we're afraid to go to hell. That's how we kind of live this thing. Well, I better, I better do these things because, you see, I, I can't live without air conditioner. So I think hell will be a nice place for me. Let, let me do these things. We do these things because we have encountered a God whose love and mercy is such that we can't but live for this God. And that's the impulse. That's the impulse of Christianity. That's it, the that's it deep soul of the gospel. And that's what we come together here on this last day where we celebrate the feast of Christ the King. So that we experience the mercy of God. And the incredible love of this God driving us forward towards something else, which is the building of a civilization of love. If in our families we live this, how would our families look? How would they be? Huh? How would they be? You see, brothers and sisters, what happens in the family and what happens in the nation are the same things. And when in the family love is not the, the driving force, then in the nation love is not the driving force. When in the family is not as a response to an incredible love from God where I am willing to sacrifice myself and put myself out for the sake of the other, then in the nation it will not be so either. Our text today is asking us something that is profound. And, and if we look back to the first reading, we see where it is laid out there. I am going to look after my sheep myself. And I'm going to keep all of it in view. As a shepherd keeps all his flock in view. When he stands up in the middle of his scattered sheep, so I will keep my sheep in view. Or the psalm, the Lord is my, the Lord is my, or oh, is shepherd, a shepherd, and the Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. Fresh and green are the pastures where he gives me repose. You prepared a banquet for me in the sight of my foes. The whole psalm speaks to the disposition of those who know and believe in God. And so our reading of the gospel from last week's reading is, is coloring the interpretation of the text from, from today. And it comes down to one simple question. Do you believe that God is a God of incredible generosity? Incredible generosity incredible love 
who, whose love for you is far more than you can ever imagine. Do you believe that? Because brothers and sisters, if you believe that, then how could we ever be stingy with someone who comes to us and is in need? And that's the impulse of this gospel. Having encountered the overwhelming nature of God's love, we cannot, we cannot, we cannot but be generous to those who come to us and are in need. And therefore, we would just give because that's what we do. We would just be generous because that's what God has done to us and therefore that's what we do to other people. But there's another mystery in our gospel here. Insofar as you did this to the least of these, you've done it to me. And that's a mystery. That's a mystery. How, how is it that, that, that when we treat the poor with mercy, that we've done that as an act of mercy to God himself? How, how is that possible? And this is another mystery that he's giving to us. Because you see, we have been fitted into Christ, grafted into him as part of his body. And, and therefore, what we do as part of his body is done in Christ. If your hand do something wrong, you can't stand up in a court and say, Your Honor, that wasn't me, you know. That wasn't me, you know. That was my hand. Can't do that. Because they'll put you to have a place up in, 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 a, in, a, in a community up, somewhere up, 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 um, up by, by, by Queen's Hall there that they'll put you. But, but if you understand how we are grafted into Christ, then every action we do is done in Christ for good or for bad. And therefore, when we love, it is Christ who is loving. And when we sin, it is Christ who is sinning. And, and when we love another who is a brother or sister who is incorporated into Christ, it is for Christ that we do what we do. And that means, brothers and sisters, we must understand the essential nature of the Christian mystery, which is that you and I are connected in a way that we cannot disconnect ourselves. And therefore, how we treat one another is how we are treating Christ. Mother Teresa has a very sobering reflection on, on holiness. Very sobering reflection. And it's simple. It's this. You love God as much as you love the person that you love the least. You got that one? You love God as much as you love the person that you love the least. You know the one your, your blood just can't take to that one? You know the one I'm talking about? Eh? Come now, man. Only know the one I'm talking about? Where your blood just can't take she. Or your blood just can't take he. That's the one I'm talking about. When you contemplate how, how you love that person, that's how you love God. And if we understand that, then there's something I have to do for the person that I love the least. And that means that as I, as I raise that bar with forgiveness and mercy and love, then, then, then the whole bar of loving God will be changed. And if we all raise that bar and started to love the person we love the least with more love, then, then something will happen in the family and something will happen in the community and something will happen in the nation and something will happen in the church and we become the kind of people who when when the stranger comes from a, a foreign land next door over the seas who speaks a strange language to us and has strange customs that we will become the kind of people who would not only welcome them but we would protect them and we will ensure their rights and we'll show that they get what they need for human dignity to live and to flourish. And when the prisoner is not receiving what they should have, we would be the ones who would be there at their side, ensuring that they receive the justice that is due to them. And we become the kind of people that, that all those who are on the fringe of society would become our friends. Why? Because we are so fringed and God chose to make us his friends. 
The impulse of this gospel, brothers and sisters, comes from the contemplation of the love that God has for us, that has been made manifest to us in Christ Jesus' his Son. I beg you at the end of this year, at the end of this liturgical year, as we prepare for Advent, where we prepare for the coming of Christ the King, I beg you, please, look and see the quality of your love. Look and see the quality of your love. Because God's love is a quality that is rich beyond measure. And I see in our society today, our love is becoming so puerile and, and so shallow and so stupid. Our hatred is so visceral. Our anger is so great. Our dismissiveness of other people is so easy. I see we are becoming a people that is going in the opposite direction to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And nothing short of a conversion of heart is required if we are actually to be the people who bring every area of our life under Christ, the universal king. 